I had a gentleman came from Africa, but he calls me and says, I got a, my, my wife came here to America with my two kids. I want to serve her papers to bring her to court for child custody. Um, and I want to take her to court and I want to bring my kids back to Africa. I met with him. He was a professional suit guy. I mean, well-spoken guy. Um, he said he was some kind of a profession, professional career he had in uh, Africa. I forget what it was. Um, but it seemed legit. No problem. So I tracked her down. Two weeks later, he calls me up. He wanted to follow her again. <sighs> okay, why? I said. He goes, well, I just want to find out if she's working, you know, where, where the kids are going to school, that type of thing. So I, I did. I went out there. Before she left, I got a weird vibe. Before she even left the house. So I'm sitting on surveillance for like three hours, let's say. I just said, you know what? This guy, he's already in court with her. Everything should be fine. I don't even know why I'm here. It's kind of not really worth doing this case. So I call him up. said, I'm done. Two weeks later, on one of my news feeds, he was arrested for hiring a hitman. To Welcome back to the Locked In Podcast. On today's episode, I have a Connecticut private detective here with me today. Ray Rano is here to not only give a different perspective of the criminal justice system on our show, but share entertaining and exciting stories from his career as a private detective. And I want to give a big thanks to all those who leave a comment on our YouTube podcast episodes or a review on our episodes on Spotify and Apple. It really does help us tremendously get the show out there to more people. And if you haven't yet, please leave us a review on Spotify or Apple or just, you know, hit that subscribe button on YouTube. And remember, you could stay up to date on all the exciting things we have coming to the Locked In podcast by following me on my Instagram at Ian underscore Bick or signing up for our mailing list list at ianbick.com. Now sit back, relax, and get ready to lock in with Ray Rano. Investigator Rano, welcome to Locked In. Thank you to Patrick and Nino for connecting us. Oh, thanks for having me. How are yeah. you doing? <laughs> and uh, you are our second um, investigator on the show in, in a couple weeks span, which is uh, cool because we've gone like over a year now without one. Yeah, and we've all got <laughs> a lot of stories, so... Yeah, definitely. Um, we have some great questions for you. Um, exciting ones. Patrick told me that you do some investigative work relating to like people um, that want to spy on like a, a wife or a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Infidelity. Yeah, it's about forty <laughs> percent of my business. Wow, and um, that's that's really exciting. And yeah. we see all that on TV and and all that, which we'll get into. Sure. Um, and you were just telling me that you uh, you had followed my story. I did uh, uh, ten or so years ago. Yeah, I was uh, interested because it was definitely a unique story. A very ambitious young man um, who, you know, did what he did and, you know, made it until he didn't. Um, but I was following it. And then uh, when I was approached about the show, I didn't put two and two together immediately, but it didn't take long, which is going online, doing a little background. Mm -hmm. um, they said, oh, I already know this guy, man. <laughs> I feel like I already know you. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. um, do you ever do like federal uh, casework at all? Not much. Okay. No, not much. I don't deal a lot with police departments either. I get referred by a lot of police departments. But remember, they're on one side of the law the prosecution side, and I'm usually on the criminal defense side. So we usually butt heads somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I asked because I had a private uh, investigator on my case, mm -hmm. uh, kind of working alongside with my um, sure. criminal defense attorney. Um, so why did you, how did you get into this kind of line of work? Well, honestly, back in 92, that's how long I go back. Before I was born. <laughs> Before you were born, yeah. <laughs> um, I had just gotten out of school, and I was thinking about becoming a police officer. Um, but at ni in 92, I don't know if you know it because of your age, but uh, the Rodney King riots in California were going on. It's basically where police officers pulled this black gentleman out of a truck, and they started to have a confrontation in the streets, and it blew up. And right after that, just like today, media is making every policeman bad. Um, so I said, well, that's a lot of scrutiny. I don't want that. Uh, so I said, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to you know, chill and see if I can do something else. I was watching a movie, Bruce Willis, uh, Damon Wayans, The Last Boy Scout. Bruce Willis was a private detective, kind of a rundown one, but pretty cool role. Uh, I said, oh, you know what? Why don't I just go private? So I back then we didn't have internet, email, and all that. So basically I created a uh, resume using my, because I worked at a retail store as the manager, and I did security. And I used to, used to be able to chase people down and tackle them in the parking lot. Can't do that anymore. Um, but I used my security experience there on a resume and just sent it, faxed it, mailed it to every private detective in the yellow pages. That's how far back it goes. Um, nobody would touch me. You need to, you need experience to be hired, but you can't be hired without experience, that type of thing. So I just kept bugging everybody. Finally, an older gentleman, Ed Day, he's no longer with us, unfortunately. Um, he says, I'm sick and tired of hearing from you. Come down, I'll bring you in, I'll train you. So I got in with him for about six months. He never paid me, 
but I was able to learn and then create an actual resume with some experience to get into a large surveillance company here where they did all insurance fraud claims. And from there, never looked back. Did you have family in, in um, law enforcement at all? Nope, not at all. So it was just a personal interest of yours? <laughs> it's just the demeanor. I, I just have that demeanor. You know, I'll even make a joke in a serious face, and people will believe what I'm saying. And <laughs> so I said, no, nah, I'm kidding with you. And they're like, oh, my God, you scared me. You know? So I just always had that demeanor, so I always fit into it. Not that growing up I was fitting the role because I was a bit of a troublemaker myself, you know. But at, you start to grow up a little bit, and then you said, okay, what, what am I going to do with my life? And police officer fit at the time until – that Rodney King incident. And uh, then I just went private. And once I got in, I'm pretty much a licensed stalker. <laughs> it's a great <laughs> job. I mean, I'm, I'm in the woods. I got ghillie suits on. I'm putting cameras everywhere. I'm chasing people. It's, I love it. It's great. Do you ever look back now and, and say you wish you took a different route and got into law enforcement and, and a different angle of it? Well, maybe for the pension, <laughs> that would be nice and some of the benefits. Um, but for the job itself, no, because honestly, I have all respect for police officers. You know, they're dealing hands-on with the criminal element. At any minute, you can get killed, shot, stabbed, whatever it may be. As a private detective, I'm more in the shadows. If you see me doing my job, then I'm not doing my job, right? So I'm kind of like clandestine. Um, I'm in the car on surveillance. The only time you're going to see me is if I'm working a criminal defense case. I got one going on now. Um, so I have to find witnesses to contradict the police report. So I'm knocking on doors. I'm banging on doors. And in some of the worst neighborhoods, because a lot of these crimes, drugs, stabbing, shootings, they're all happening in these areas. So I'm banging on doors in the middle of the day, sometimes after work in the dark. That's the only time that my job really gets too sticky. Um, but police officers, day in and day out, they're dealing with a pretty tough job. So I'll take my cushy surveillance job where I can just lift my camera. I'm good. Now, before we dive into this, um, I want you to plug your TikTok because you were talking about ghillie suits and stuff, and your TikTok has yeah. funny, entertaining kind of points of view on it. So, you know, let the people know where they could find you. Yeah, I actually got to give credit to my wife because uh, it was during um, uh, the pandemic there um, when we were pretty much sitting around bored, closed down. Um, we, My wife said, you should do TikTok because your job is interesting. So I said, okay, I'm all right. So I started making them. Um, TikTok didn't like me much at first. They banned like four of my accounts. <laughs> I don't know why, because their guidelines are ridiculous. But um, finally, I got the groove where I kind of like toned it down just a little bit. And I started telling the stories. Uh, the TikTok itself is uh, ctprivatedetective.com. That's the, you can even go just ctprivatedetective. Either way, you'll find me. Um, but as soon as I started doing it and get into a rhythm, it really started to build up for me. And Really now, in my domestic side of investigations, I don't have to advertise anymore. TikTok brings most of those clientele in. Isn't that amazing with TikTok? And it's so cool to see um, professions and professionals use yeah. social media in an entertainment way, which translates into business for them. Yeah. I never had the response to that I'm getting on TikTok that I ever from uh, Facebook, Instagram, just didn't do it for me. It's going out to mostly it's going out to people that you're already friends with. Um, you know, unless you're doing the paid ads, again, paid advertisement. But TikTok, if you put the right uh, hashtags, if you put everything right in there, it, it spreads. And, and you're you get just one being, good video and you're, you're good. And you're being your authentic self. Yeah, just telling <laughs> stories. I mean, just saying what I do for a living. And it has a certain element of excitement. It has a certain element of a lot of toys, a lot of spy stuff. So it, it seems to click well. What was it like working your first case? Wow. My first case going way back on my own or my first case ever on your, on your, I would say on your own, maybe not the insurance aspect of it. Like your first real private detective. Yeah. So this is something else. Um, so I, I was, I had gotten out of my apprenticeship five years in Connecticut. You have to work full time before you're going to be approved for licensing. So once I did that, a partner I was with at that surveillance company I talked about, we got together, we opened a company, and we started doing a lot of um, insurance fraud cases. Back then, it was very easy to get on insurance lists. Um, we, were, we were doing great. But it came to the point where I was like, you know what? I'm babysitting now. I'm driving around making sure my surveillance guys aren't sleeping in the car and writing a report as opposed to me actually investigating. I didn't like that. So I talked to my partner. I went my own way. I opened my own, and that was in 2001. Now, this business that I'm in myself, my first phone call, phone rings, it's a gentleman who owns a brothel in Connecticut, right? I said, oh, this is interesting. He's like, yeah, uh, one of the girls that work here, I'm dating. You know, I've been dating her for a few years, even though she's a working girl. Um, she disappeared. She took off. I want to know what happened to her. I said, okay, all right, let's check this out. So I drove down to his location. I met with him in his vestibule of his place, and he, he gave me a, a pretty decent retainer to go track her down. So I started working for him. It took me about maybe five days. I tracked her to Florida. He wanted to follow her, see what she was up to. I said, okay, let me call one of my guys down in Florida who's licensed because I can't go back and forth. I got you know things to do. Um, I hired him. I contracted him. He followed her around. Then she disappeared again. 
I had to track her down again, right, um, into New Jersey. I found her. So, again, I flew my guy up from Florida because he was slow, and I paid him to follow her around. And we, we both tag team. We went back and forth, and we were doing it. And she wasn't doing anything all that crazy, but my client was very incessant. My client was like, come down here. you got to come down here. So, like, every three days I was meeting him at the brothel in the front vestibule, not in the actual business, and talking to him, updating him, showing video clips, showing him this and that. I'd say probably about six months into doing this, right, on top of other cases, I get pulled in by the uh, state police um, organized crime division because they've been conducting an investigation for a RICO act on him. And my car's been out there every couple of days. So they got my plate on, on, on film. They got me, they're showing me all these pictures. Three of them for three hours were just reaming me at this uh, police department. And then finally I said, look, here's the report. I showed him one of my reports with my client's authorization. I'm just following a girl, man. You know, leave me alone. It's, 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 it's all it is. So at that point, of course, I disclosed to my client they were investigating him. So he started to try, try to wrap up his business. But that was my first case on my own. Wow. So do you normally um, travel across state lines a lot? I do. If I'm tailing someone, um, I'll follow my file somebody over to Florida before. I mean, it's just everywhere. driving. Just driving. Yeah. Every right. time they pull into a gas station, so do I. Wow. You just stay, you know, in a, in a highway situation. It's a little easier as long as you can contain, maintain visual on the car. That's the problem is you'll have a, you know, a, a black certain type of vehicle. And if you stop paying attention for one second, the same type of vehicle, next thing you know, you're following the wrong car with the wrong license plate. But if you pay attention, you can actually follow them all the way down. You just have to mimic their movements if you're going that long. How many cases can you take on at one time? It all depends um, on the types of cases. If it's something that's going to occupy a good portion of my week, then I won't be able to take as many. But if it's something that's piecework, like uh, like the criminal defense case, I have to locate a witness, go knock on his door, then I'm done for now. I can shoot over to a surveillance and spend seven hours, eight hours over there. So I can get a lot of things done that way. Um, but I've had up to 40 open cases at one time. How long does it take to close the average case? Well, it depends on whether I get the result or my client runs out of money. Okay. So. Wh- which one normally happens first? The result. The result. Yeah, the get. result. I mean, usually I can, when I'm interviewing clients up front, I can usually determine what type of budget they're on. Um, you know, so if somebody's like, oh, I don't care what I ha- have to spend for this, then I'm able to do the investigation and, and follow every lead, right? As opposed to someone who comes in and if I say, well, it's a, you know, let's say a thousand dollar retainer. Oh man, that's, I know already. Okay. Let me prioritize this case because I'm not going to get very far. So if I'm going to utilize this person's money and that's all they have. I got to try to get something immediately as opposed to trying to, you know, do a more broad investigation. Yeah. So walk us through a stakeout. What's that like when, when you get tasked with something, you have to go on a stakeout for seven or eight hours like that? Well, it's uh, it's either super exciting or super boring, right? So uh, I'll do a pre-investigation on every case first, make sure I verify vehicles, make sure the person lives at the address that the client is providing, um, do a little bit of, um, social media background to see if they have any upcoming plans. Like somebody will put on Facebook, oh, going to the game this weekend. Well, I know I'm going to schedule that day, right? Um, so I try to prepare myself ahead of time. But once I start the actual surveillance, I arrive at the location. I scout out the area to see either do I have a direct view of the residence where I can blend in with other cars parked on the street? Um, do I, if it's a very difficult, like I say, a cul-de-sac, do I set up on the cul-de-sac? I'm probably going to get the cops called on me, even though I notify them ahead of time I'm in the area. Still trouble. Um, so I'll see, look at the map and determine what's the most likely means of aggress, the way that the client or the claimant or the subject will leave. Um, and then I'll set up a surveillance on that side street. So they'll pass by me. But once I get situated, then it's a matter of, are they leaving or are they sitting home all day? If they leave, awesome. I'm chasing them around to supermarkets, to this place, to that place. I'm just tailing all day long. It's great. If they don't leave, let's say they're on a worker's comp injury and they actually are injured because we're just there to find out if they are or not. I could be sitting there eight hours in my car all day and do nothing. Yeah. And that's like, oh, That's got to be boring. Yeah. Well, it used to be. Now it's Netflix. You know, all <laughs> kinds of shit I can do, you know, to keep myself occupied. And you're taking photos and videos and whatnot yeah, when needed? Yeah, I'll, I'll take street sign photos, a house, you know, I'll drive by and get some video of the house, cars in the driveway, some identifying information from, you know, so I can prevent it, uh, present it to my client. Because um, you got to make every, every video and every report has to be more of a story, right? You have to have a beginning, middle, and an end. Um, so it's not just about taking one picture of the guy lifting something he's not supposed to. It's the cars in the driveway, the house. What does he have in his yard? Does he have a lawnmower sitting out there, a push one he's not supposed to be pushing? You find things that may contribute to the investigation while you're out there. So we identify everything at first. And then every day when I go back, because it's usually not one day of surveillance, three, four, five could be. Um, every day might be something different. There might be a different car in the driveway. You have to figure out whose car that is. Is that somebody visiting or did the uh, claimant or subject buy a new car? 
So there's a lot entailed in it. But once you get settled in, then it's a matter of do they leave? Yes. <laughs> or do they not? <sighs> Have you ever had like a really nosy neighbor like we see in the movies ruin a stakeout for you? Yeah. And that's not really the neighbor's fault. It's the police department sometimes because if I'm sitting outside any neighborhood, USA, it doesn't matter. Um, there's a guy sitting out for four hours in a car. Any reasonable person is either going to approach me or see what I'm doing, or they're going to call the police because they're afraid to approach me. Okay. So if they call the police, I call in ahead of time. So I par- I'm going to be at 123 Main Street is the house I'm watching. I'm sitting down at uh, 129 Main Street, four houses down, let's say. I call the police. I say, I'm private detective. I'm licensed. Here's my license number. Here's my vehicle information, cell phone. I'm going to be sitting right here. How long are you going to be there? I don't know. Maybe two o'clock is when I'm done. Now, they know that. So if the person calls from the house and they say, hey, there's a suspicious guy outside, he's sitting out there all day, the police should say, and most of the time do, well, we know he's there, he's okay. Don't disclose what I'm doing, but just say that. But sometimes they just, they're bored or whatever it may be, and they'll show up, two cars, lights on, sirens, and they just blow the day. And I'm like, oh, what are you doing, man? You know? Have you ever been taken into custody? Well, no. Never? Okay. No, never have. That does happen though, right? It does if you don't follow the laws, right? So I can easily trespass to get something. I can easily, um, you know, on a night surveillance, I can easily start shooting video of the person inside of their house through their windows. If I get caught, I'll be arrested because that's violating their privacy, right? Mm -hmm. I can report that. I just can't shoot it, right? So if you start breaking the laws, then you're going to have some problems. There's no doubt about it. Um, If you're lying to the police, you know, because as a private detective with our license, if they ask us something, we have to disclose it other than client information. Um, you know, if you start playing games with them, they could take you in for something, I'm sure. But if you follow the rules and just do your job the proper way, nah, you don't got nothing to worry about. How do police officers look at private detectives? Uh, well, it depends. Like I said, I get a lot of them that refer me because, you know, they deal in the criminal. A lot of times people are asking them about civil, so they'll refer who they think is a good investigator. I've been around so long, most of them know me. Um, the police on the street doing their job, I think the majority of them are good. I do. I know a lot of them. They're great. Nobody's there out there targeting people. Nobody's, you know, uh, trying to make trouble for anybody. They're just doing the job. They want to go home safe. So, but then you get bad ones in every group, right? So you'll have one or two out of a department that maybe are playing games or maybe they are prejudiced or maybe they're whatever the reason. You're going to get that. And unfortunately, that spoils it for everybody because the media, again, back to the Rodney King days, will take that and they'll run with it. They'll spin it so they can sensationalize it to make more ratings. And that just makes everybody's public opinion, oh, police are bad, police are bad, when in reality, I don't think so. Yeah. What are some outrageous requests you've gotten calls in for to uh, to work a case? <sighs> well, I had, um, and I recently did a TikTok about this. It's not really outrageous, but the situation itself is outrageous. So I had a gentleman came from Africa. He was from Kenya. He comes over and he was uh, staying in a hotel in Putnam, Connecticut, on the uh, northeast side. Now, this is very common, all right, because in Connecticut, in order to serve somebody papers for anything, you have to verify the address first. Now, back in the day, you just send mail to the house. It didn't matter. So now you have to verify an address. So he calls me. He says, I got a, my my wife came here to America with my two kids. I want to serve her papers to bring her to court for child custody. Um, And I want to take her to court and I want to bring my kids back to Africa. I said, okay, well, I'll meet with you. Um, We'll sit down. We'll figure out what we can do. I met with him. He was a professional suit guy. I mean, well-spoken guy. Um, he said he was some kind of a profession, professional career he had in uh, Africa. I forget what it was, um, but it seemed legit. No problem. So I tracked her down. Um, she had a court date. She went to court. He wanted me to follow her after court to find out where her, her actual address was because I tracked her to the town. I knew she was there, but we didn't have a physical address. So after court, when she comes out and she was with him in court, she comes out with one of the marshals from the court as an escort. And some other female who I later determined was a domestic abuse advisor, right? Um, so I called him. I said, hey, do you have a protective order or a restraining order or something going on here? Because I've asked you before when I first talked to him. No, no, no. We just had it out in court today. Um, we both agreed not to move forward with a restraining order. Okay. He sent me the paper, legit from the court. All right. So now I can follow her, right? So I follow her back to the address that she is. She's at. I call him up. I give him the address. Everything's good. I said, all right, I'm done. Okay, we're good. About two weeks later, he calls me up. He wanted to follow her again. Okay, why? I said. He goes, well, I just want to find out if she's working, you know, where, where the kids are going to school, that type of thing. So I, I did. I went out there. Before she left, I got a weird vibe. Before she even left the house. So I'm sitting on surveillance for like three hours, let's say. I just said, you know what? This guy, he's already in court with her. Everything should be fine. I don't even know why I'm here. 
it's kind of not really worth doing this case. So I call him up and said, I'm done. I don't really need to be here. Well, I'm going to close the case out at this point. No problem. Two weeks later, on one of my news feeds, he was arrested for hiring a hitman to kill her. Holy cow. So what happened was he got here, and he didn't have a car, obviously. He's from Africa. <laughs> he uh, was using Uber drivers. The Uber driver, he was asking every time he got in the car, do you know someone I can hire to kill my wife? And the Uber driver was like, no. So the Uber driver, one of them, went to the police, the state police, and told the story. State police posed as the hitman. They actually met together, and he paid them a deposit to kill his wife. So would they just reach out to him saying, hey, we're hitmen? Well, no, the Uber driver got back in touch with him and said, I found somebody, uh, but it was the state police. That is so being disguised wild. As a, being disguised as a hitman. And they collected, I think, a $400 deposit from him, and he was supposed to pay 4000 or something when, when the job was done, which was ridiculous to begin with. But I guess if you, if you translate U.S. money into Kenyan money, I don't know, maybe that makes a difference. Yeah. Um, but he's in jail. He's How did that make you feel that you were kind of a part of the stakeout and whatnot and giving him information? I was happy that it never happened because then I would be like, oh, man, I contributed to that. Not intentionally, but, you know, and you never know because, I remember, my clientele is from politicians to celebrities to, um, you know, influential people right down to criminals. I mean, there's a wide range of people that I work with. So I try to weed most of that out during my initial consultation and interview with them, and I'm pretty good at it. This guy just happened to get through because he really was, you know, he really seemed um, like a decent person, like a professional, well-spoken. And and when I found that, I was like, wow, unbelievable. So I put that on TikTok and that one blew up nice. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> I got called in by the state police from the TikTok. Oh, they to, called you in? I had to give a statement. Yeah. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. So is it really like the movies where someone will hire you to get, like, say, dirt on someone? You show up at that person's house with the folder and the photos, and you're like, here you go. Here's everything. And, you know, drop whatever you have against this person or whatnot. No, that that? that would be blackmail and extortion. So you can't do that. uh, Do you think that people use your information for that? Yeah, they could. That you give them? They could. But I also warn them when I give it to them. Because a lot of times you'll a husband will hire me. I'll catch the wife cheating. He'll want to send a package to the other spouse. (laughs) Right. I said, well, I'll give you a generic report. I don't have a problem with that. But just understand that if you do that and it's construed by that person as extortion, blackmail or anything else, they're going to go to the police and you might get in trouble for that. You know, so they got to be real careful with it. Do you have to testify like divorce hearings when you give someone information and then they submit it to the court for like proof of, uh, say, like uh, cheating or or whatnot and for a settlement with prenups and all that? Yeah. With uh, with video attached to my reports. Um, most times, no, I don't have to testify in domestic cases because the other party's not arguing that this guy was kissing the female because we see it, right? Insurance different. I testify a lot on insurance fraud cases because the opposing party that's representing the claimant, as opposed to me representing the insurance company, they want to they want to just pick it apart. In a cross examination, I'm sure you've been through it, right? So, <laughs> I, I testified at <laughs> my own trial. Yeah, so you know how it is. Just the cross examination is the worst part of going to court because yeah. they want to know what kind of camera did you use, how long you've been doing it, what time did you wake up in the morning, what did you have for breakfast, anything. Um, so they'll run you through the ringer, just trying to find anything to trip you up so that your evidence can be excluded from the case. Um, so those I do, and those they're the worst part of the job testifying. Yeah, but I mean, in the domestic side, no, never. That's why criminal defense attorneys don't want their client to testify, not because of what their client will say with them. It's what the prosecution's going to ask them and mm-hmm. how they react. Like the Sam Bankman Fried trial. Yeah, he blew up his own testimony, getting agitated and combatant and stuff. And you got to remain cool, calm, and collected. And I think that might be true too for Fanny, Fanny Willis trial. Oh, uh, yeah. The, the uh, evidentiary hearing. Yeah. That might be true for her, too. She came up there with guns out, man. <laughs> <laughs> and she's a prosecutor, and she's a too. DA. I, mean, I wonder she how that's going to play out. Yeah. I don't know. My, my, whole, my whole thing on that, not to get off topic, but she's the DA, right? So if you're, if you're paying someone back cash because you think it might be a conflict, you would intentionally leave a paper trail, right? If I'm paying someone back and I know that it could be scrutinized later in some kind of legal hearing, I'm going to make sure that I do a money order, something. But she just used cash and just it just it's too vague. It's, it seems strange to me. It, yeah, the whole thing's a little suspicious. It, just the very. whole everything and that the, he's they had a romantic thing together. They should have disclosed something. It just I don't know. Yeah, a lot of mistakes there. <laughs> so what's your typical case you would say nowadays that someone calls you for? Um, well, I mean, there's like I said, it varies. I do a lot of different things. I do asset searches for a lot of people. Um, I do criminal defense, job custody, the infidelities, the insurance fraud. Um, cohabitation cases have been up. You know, somebody has uh, divorces and they have to pay alimony to the wife and the wife a year later starts living with this guy but not telling anybody and the guy's contributing to household costs, of course. 
Um, my client wants to get his alimony reduced, so I have to prove that they're living together and that a reasonable person would infer that he's probably picking up some of the tab um, to get his alimony reduced. So that's a lot of surveillance. That's a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot of um, garbage picking, mm-hmm. if you will. I do a lot of that these days. Digging so, through the physical garbage? Yeah, somebody will put their – if I'm looking for something on somebody, mm-hmm. that's the best way to get it is they put their garbage on the curb at 3 o'clock in the morning. I go out there and grab it. <laughs> I go through it. I'll grab three, four bags at a time. That's yeah. how they caught the Idaho uh, murder. That's right. That's mm-hmm. a, you'd be surprised what people throw away. Wow. Yeah. So, so um, it, how much access do you have to court systems, um, any type of law enforcement system as a, as a PI? Well, <clears throat> depending on the circumstances, like motor vehicle stuff, I have access to it for certain parameters, for certain legal reasons. Um, somebody can't just call me, hey, I got a license plate. Can you give, tell me who? I can't do that. Um, but for an insurance case, I need to know who's in the house, things like that. I can run those. We used to not be able to. It was difficult, but now it's a little more loosened. Um, but you, it's very strict. You're audited, right? So um, criminal records, obviously, it's not a big deal. I do a lot of FOIA requests, Freedom of Information Act requests, um, because even if I look up somebody's criminal conviction history, I'm not going to know about all the incident reports, domestic calls, uh, you know, anything that involves that person. So when I request from a police department, Everything, 911 recordings, uh, body cam footage. I request everything that they have on a particular person. They got a, four days to respond. They received it, and then they got to come back with a list of this is what we have. What do you want? I want it all. Right? Ooh, I might use you. I want it all. I want my whole criminal file. Can you get fed stuff or I no? I get fed stuff, sure. I want my mugshot to put on a T-shirt. Yeah, we can I think get that it. would be so funny. Yeah, we can do a FOIA request for it. It's public information. You yeah, just the local don't person. have access to it without FOIA, though. Yeah. Now, so do you have more systems than the average person? Like, I couldn't look up something on my own. No, a lot of people call me, a lot of potential clients will call me up and say, I'm trying to find somebody or find information. I, I use the, like a Intellis or one of those online things. It's all, it's all historical information. It's all garbage. The databases that we use, you have to literally provide them with the, your detective license and uh, you know identification and your address, your business location, everything. And then we have access to records, yeah. Um, it's not everything in the world, but it's definitely a lot better. The problem is sometimes you get into a database that you're using and you're paying for, and they just start getting outdated. So you jump ship, you go to the next one, and they're a little more updated, and you kind of keep doing that over and over every year. So you kind of switch over because, you know, a lot of people get stagnant, and they just like, eh. And then the next one wants to get more clientele in, so they start updating their stuff. Um, but we have pretty good information. I, I can literally find people pretty easily. And if it's not just directly through the address that's provided on the pullout I do, there's everything from every house you've ever owned, all your criminal convictions, all your relatives, all their relatives. I mean, addresses, home ownership, taxes, every, not taxes, but property taxes. Mm-hmm. Um, I, have, I have a stack of 70, 80 pages of information that I can go through to try to narrow out and figure out where you are. How accurate are those online ones? Like, you know, when you search someone's name and it's like pay 30 bucks or whatnot to get all this information, yeah. sometimes it gives you a home address, but I'm assuming that comes from like where you're, where you're registered to vote. Yeah. Well, that or property ownership sometimes. So if if the person you're looking for is not really difficult to find because they have a house somewhere, uh, it may work. But if there's someone who, if you run that and you can't find them, that's it. They're not going to dig into that they're staying at their cousin Judy's house on the couch. You know, they're not going to find uh, that, well, he moves every two months, so they only have the this one, and they miss the, the most two newest ones' addresses. It's not going to do anything like that. So it's going to maybe one out of a ten shot when you use that, you'll get the right information. But most of the time, it's like I said, it's, a, it's all uh, historic information. It's never really up to date. Has your job gotten easier since social media has evolved? Um, social media, a little bit, yeah. I mean, because I have we have databases, specific databases that will give me everybody's social media. I mean, they'll give me everything that they can grab. Uh, if you're on dating sites, if you're on you know adult dating sites, sites. Oh. yeah. Now they'll give me just the link, then sometimes like an old username and a, a, a predated password that's no longer good information they've come across. So I'll get a lot of information. But again, if you sift through, you can find a lot of information. But that'll be like 200 pages of different things that you have on on, on the internet. Um, So that does help. And again, a lot of times if somebody doesn't have a closed Facebook, a private one, um, or, you know, Instagram or even a TikTok, a lot of people love to share. Like I said, oh, I'm going to the football game this weekend, you know, and that's perfect for me because now I don't have to sit out there for 10 hours and wait for the guy to leave the house. I just go that morning and know he's going to a game. You know, I even pre-buy the tickets so I can get in. (laughs) I mean, it's simple. Are you ever shocked by what some people post and write on social media? Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, you should know better. I mean, if you have a workers' comp claim, for example, 
uh, you know, total disability. I can't lift anything. And then you go to a weightlifting competition with your buddy and you put it on Facebook. <laughs> Come on. You know, I don't even have to do surveillance. Just print out that video or, you know, duplicate the video and give it to my client. It's, it's over. But people do that. They do. It, it's, I don't understand. I mean, people don't think. What, know? what's one case that will never leave your mind that just like maybe horrified you or surprised you? I had, this is going back a bit when I was still partner with my, my guy there. We had an insurance workers' comp insurance claim fraud case, and it was down in the, the southern part of the state. So it was, and we did a lot of work for colleges back then as well, because some colleges have their own police departments on campus, things like that. So we would actually follow police officers that worked for the colleges um, because they were still under the payroll of the college technically in some way. So a human resource director would call us up, give us the case. He's been on workers' comp for a year, got into an auto accident with his, you know, his police vehicle. He's claiming this, this, and this, but we don't buy it. We want to see what he's up to. Okay. So we get this one gentleman who's a police officer. He is on total disability, can't even answer the phones at the police office, at the police department, because, you know, he's so, so much in pain, he can't sit for eight hours a day. Okay. We start surveillance. <clears throat> Within two or three days, I think, we follow him to a location where it's a, they're building houses, okay? The, it's a gravel driveway, goes way back into the woods, can't see anything. But we followed him there. We we'll say, I don't know what he's doing here. We'll have to figure it out. So we start doing Google Aerial, see what's going on. The property that he's on happens to line up with the state forest. Okay, perfect. So what do we do? We drive around the other side of the state forest. We put on our ghillie suits, which if people don't know, ghillie suit is basically an entire suit, head wrap, boots, everything that's got grass and leaves and everything. So you blend in with the, uh, the surrounding atmosphere. And we had about a mile hike from where we got into the state forest to the backyard of this property. We get to the backyard, we get down, we got our little tripods out with cameras. We see him back there. He's with an older gentleman who we later determined was his uh, relative. And they're building the house. They're the contractors for their own house they're building. We were put on that case for three months while the entire house was built. He got in a lot of trouble for that. Insurance fraud, arrested, everything. Wow. Yeah. Funniest part about that case, my partner had to testify, right? Now, when a lot of times during that case, when we were running the cameras, we get bored, we get hungry, whatever. We set up the camera, just leave it running, and we would walk away, go eat, you know, have some food, whatever, come back. Unknowing to my partner, when we turned over the video, because we duplicated it all to give to the clients, this gentleman who was the claimant happened to walk up to the woods where the camera was, pulled out his little dinghy there and started taking a piss in the woods. Right, didn't I didn't see right the camera, film. though. No, I didn't see the camera. <laughs> but everybody in the courtroom saw it when he played it. It was on tape. It was playing in the courtroom. My client, my, my partner was like, oh, my God, I can't believe that's on there. You guys didn't look at the tip. Uh, there was hours and hours of video. Yeah. We, don't, we don't dub it. We don't edit it. So, you know, it's just from start to finish. We put a header on the front of it, and then a, at the end we put a tail on it, but the video stays unedited. Oh, and because if it's edited, that's probably a legal It's a problem issue. in court. Yeah. yeah, right, because if you get cross-examined now, well, why is there a break here? And why is it, you know, so you don't want to edit it. So it just ran, and it was so many hours that I just let it duplicate onto a DVD um, and didn't even look at it, just let it run. So I didn't even know it was there. That's funny. Are there ever cases where you're working it and halfway through you're like, I got to go to the police or I got to pass this on? No, I don't think so. I never really had a problem with that. I would have passed on the one from Africa if I knew at the time, but no, I never really had a problem. I never had to rat out any of my clients to for anything like that. If anything, I would have had a talk with them first. You know what I mean? I'm not really one to run to the police. Uh, their business is their business. If they're about to commit a murder or something, that's a little different. I mean, obviously. So most people have good intentions when they hire you? I don't know. That's mm -hmm. the problem. I try to weed them out with my uh, interviews with them. But sometimes they just slip through the cracks. I mean, I, and don't forget, too, I do a lot of criminal defense work, right? So everybody in jail is innocent. You know that, <laughs> right? So they're all going to tell me they're innocent. But are they? Some of them probably not, right? But I don't ask the direct question because I don't want the direct answer because I don't want to know. I just want to defend you, right? Um, so I'll go through and I'll start doing a case for someone. And the, wor the worst ones for me, let's, let's put it this way, the ones that keep me up at night, okay? I do a lot of cases for criminal defense where someone's accused of an S.A., Right? That's how you want to say it here? No, you could say the whole thing. Okay, yeah. so they're accused of a sexual assault on a minor. All right? And the, the attorney calls me up says, I got a new case. I need you to come in. We sit down. We go through the police reports and everything else. And I'm like, okay, another one of these. Now, I'm not going to ask the guy, did he do it or not? Right? Because I don't want to know. But I have to go up the assumption that he's innocent because I'm going to prove that. Or I'm going to at least create a reasonable doubt so, no pun intended, he gets off. Right? Um, 
But my biggest fear is that, okay, so I got this gentleman, I work hard, I create reasonable doubt, or I find that the police improperly did something technique-wise, uh, you know, and we, we, he, gets, uh, he gets off. If he goes out and does it again, that's on me, right? Maybe not really, but it would feel like it's on me. It's never happened that I know of. But that's the only thing that really bothers me in this line of work is that if I actually get one of those guys off who actually is guilty and does it again, I feel partially responsible for that. It feels like a no-win situation too because if you were to not disclose that information that you know could let him free – then you feel morally wrong at that. It, like, it, there's no winning in that scenario. Too. Yeah. You mean if during my investigation I prove he's guilty? <laughs> Is that what you mean? No, I mean, like, if you withheld, uh, to like, if you withheld the information that he was um, innocent because you knew he was guilty. Oh, yeah. No, I would and never. That, yeah, yeah, something I like can. that. I can never do that. My job is my job is really not to care, right? My job is to take the case. My job is defense, create a defense, get the evidence, and, and win. That's my job. You know, it's hard not to get personally involved sometimes, but you have to put that out. You can't. Otherwise, I, I would never work for any criminal defense attorneys because what would be the point? Because do I know if he's guilty? He's not guilty? I don't know. So you can't really go by that. Same with insurance fraud. You know, what if the guy's really injured? I'm out there videotaping him. He's really, he just had surgery three months ago on his back, let's say. So he's really injured. But I get him lifting his lawnmower for whatever reason to fix the blade. Maybe that's a one-off, but I still got it on tape. Mm -hmm. One way or the other, I'm not a judge. I don't decide. Yeah. I get my evidence. I give it to you. You bring it to court, and then the judge and the jury decide. Yeah, you have one of those uh, professions where you have to leave your feelings at the door. You can't yeah. mix the two of them together. Yeah, and back when I first started on my own, um, the infidelity cases used to get to me a little bit because I'd videotape some guy's wife you know, with a man in a car after a bar in the parking lot, and I'd get the entire thing pretty much on tape. And then I'd bring him in, and I'd say, okay, here's the— show him the video, and he'd start crying in front of me. A grown man crying. It's like, oh, damn, I feel bad, you know? But after a while, you start to build that wall. And it's now it's like, that's what you hired me for. I got you what you wanted. Here it is. You are you ever, kinda, when, you're on, when you're on those kind of cases, are you ever looking at the people, like, that are about to do it and say, oh, don't do that, don't do that, like, to yourself, like, don't cheat, don't cheat, and then when you realize they cheat, you're like, oh, shit. Yeah, I mean, not so much like that, but similar, like, uh-oh. Here we go. No. <laughs> Is it going to happen? That kind of thing. Yeah. And and it's it, <clears throat> not going to lie. When you – we're going to – I'm going to – as a private detective, I'm an objective third party, right? I'm not supposed to care. I'm just supposed to go out, do my time, get my evidence, whatever's in front of me, and present it. But there are times where, like, if I'm on a workers' comp case, I don't want the guy to do something wrong. That's not my job. But I'm so bored sometimes in the car that when he starts doing something wrong, I'm like, yeah, you know, like, oh, video, good video I can get from it, you know. But it's not so much that I'm happy he's doing it. It's just that I'm happy I'm, I'm doing something. You know, I'm actually creating something that seems worthy of what my clients are paying me for. Because if you pay me for eight hour days of sitting out there, I sit out there for three days, he never leaves the house. I give you the bill. You can be like, Ugh, I'm paying for this. Right. Even though I didn't do anything wrong, the guy didn't leave. So it's always better to get something that your client will at least be happy that they spent the money on. In most of your cases, do the individuals go to trial or do they plead out when they see the evidence maybe you present? The insurance fraud cases? No, the criminal defense cases. Um, it depends. I mean, a lot of them, the system is, well, I know you had a, a, an attorney on recently. I saw that. <laughs> the system is bad. There's no doubt about it. I mean, the, sometimes the best I can hope for is let's say I got a client who's up for a 10-year rap, right? And and the person who accused him has a history of their own, like a pretty rough history. That's more easy for me to find witnesses to say that they lied. Oh, I got two guys that say that she lied on a police report, right? That's be beautiful because now the prosecutor doesn't want to go and say, oh, well, we're relying on this police report because, you know, it's all he said, she said in certain cases. Um, but we already know we have history and we have evidence that she lied to police on these two different reports. So the prosecutor is going to say, okay, well, instead of 10 years, I'll give you three because I don't want to take it to court. Now, innocent or not, he might still be stuck with that because three years is better than 10. And if he fights anymore, he may get to 10. So that's kind of like where it's weird. So sometimes our evidence doesn't necessarily get somebody off completely, but it'll get at least reduced to something that they're willing to take, if you want to say that. Have you ever seen someone take a plea deal and you know that they're innocent, but they don't want the pressure of going to trial and trying to prove it? I don't know if I've ever seen someone take it that way. Because I don't know, a lot of times I don't know if they're, I mean, it's very rare that I'm going to, it's not like Matlock, the television show, right? Where he, he, he 
yells out in court and the, the person on the stand admits it. Oh, yeah, I did it. You know, <laughs> it's never like that. Um, it's always a fine line. We have to create more confusion than we do innocence, right? Uh, it's hard to prove a negative. So it's hard to prove my client didn't do something as opposed to the prosecution proving he did do something. Proving someone didn't do something is, is, is impossible unless they have, you know, an alibi or something. But the police usually find that ahead of time if they do their job properly. Um, but I did have one gentleman who was, it was more of a, a well, it was a criminal case because he was, he was accused again of a sexual assault with uh, his own uh, child, right? And it, it turned into a very big mess because he was a prominent person. He was accused and I knew he was definitely innocent. I don't, I don't, shouldn't say I, I knew. I, I, in myself, I knew he was innocent because I could just tell who he was. It, it, had, it was nothing to do with kids at all. I didn't want anything to do with his own kids, to be honest with you. He was so busy working. He just didn't care. Um, but this person wanted his money. And he wanted to divorce him, wanted his money, so she made up the allegation. And we, we investigated, we investigated, we investigated. I got a ton of statements to saying he's such a good guy, character reference statements, a ton of stuff where he was going to win. I mean, he was literally going to win the case and the charges were going to be dropped. And because this person we also proved by re reviewing and scrutinizing the police reports proved that she lied to the police in the reports multiple times about him. So they were actually going to arrest her. So what did she do? She left the kid with him and she took off to another country. Oh, wow. Non-extraditable. So, and he's fine though. He's he, got the kid. He's okay. a happy man. Uh, he paid his, all his fees and legal fees. And uh, we won. We won the hell out of that case. Um, but did he win because we proved he was innocent? No. But we proved she was guilty. Yeah. You know, so. And sometimes that's kind of the, that's the enough. same thing. It's right? enough sometimes, yeah. What are some tools of the trade as a, an investigator? I know you said ghillie suits sometimes and, and cameras. What are some other knickknacks and, and whatnot? Um, I'm big because I go in a lot. So if you're following someone on surveillance, let's say an infidelity case, um, and the, um, the, the wife hires me, I'm following the husband, the husband, I follow him around, let's say gas station, car wash, always car wash, of course, before you pick up the girl, right? And then he meets her at a bar. Wait, why a car wash? Well, if a guy's going to pick up his, his, his sweetie there on the side, he wants a clean car. So it's always a car wash. Really? As soon as somebody goes to the car wash, I'm like, oh, what's next? Definitely. <laughs> all the time. It's amazing how they do that. <clears throat> Women, not so much. Women don't care so much because they usually jump in the guy's car. You know what I mean? It's never Men always want to drive. It's very rare that I find a guy jump into a female's car. Just doesn't happen that often. And how close are they picking up the person to the to the house? Uh, well, depends. Sometimes on the same street. Really, I've had people cheating on the same street, but most times it's just you know within the town or the next town over, things like that. And it's usually work related. Most of the time it's work related. Somebody they work with, things like that. So, uh, I'll he'll go to the bar. Let's say he picks her up at a house. I'll videotape her getting in his car. They go to some bar somewhere. I will actually go in the bar. So now I need tools there. I can't just walk in on my iPhone and you know, start shooting video. So I'll actually walk in with uh, all these little chip cameras, we call them. I used to call them back in the day. Now they're more DVR type cameras. So I have uh, a key fob, right? The key fob has a pinhole lens. It's got a little SD card in it. I turn it on, put my keys on it, and I just go right, put it on the bar, sit there, have a beer, and let the camera do all the work. I have a coffee mm -hmm. cup. So if I go into a coffee location or a supermarket, wherever I need to be, I just take the lid off, turn it on, put the cap on, and it looks like I'm walking around with a coffee. Meantime, I'm videotaping everything. Now, Connecticut's kind of a small state when you think of the bigger picture. Does anyone ever run into you that you've maybe exposed or worked a case against and kind of blew your cover or anything? Clients. I run into clients all the time. And the biggest problem is <laughs> it, it, you can't, I, don't, I don't ever say hi, right? So I'll look at them. They'll look at me. And if they say hi, then I'm comfortable. Otherwise, I'll ignore them because I don't know who they're with. I don't know if they told anybody their story. But there's a lot of times where I'll catch a spouse cheating. Some, the, let's say the wife will hire me. I'll catch the husband cheating. I give them the report. After that, they don't call me back and say I divorced them. They don't tell me. So a lot of times they won't divorce. They'll stay with them. They'll fight it out. They'll get through it. And then I'll see them a year later together somewhere after I just juiced this guy with some chick. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no. I'm like, oh, I hope they didn't talk about me. You know? I hope she didn't show him my report and he looked me up. And so, But no, the, nobody I've ever followed recognized me, but my clients, they recognize me out all the time. That's funny. Yeah. Do you ever see that show that was on HBO? Um, the girl, she runs, she has like this house and she has like a partnership with some production company where they ex expose uh, child predators. They're like private investigators themselves. I don't know if they're licensed or not, but they work hand in hand with the police and they did some episodes in Connecticut. I've seen a lot of videos on TikTok, mm -hmm. but I've never seen the show. I forgot the name of it. I got I to gotta find it. But I, it was really interesting how they have like this whole house in operation. They're using social media 
to to piece everything together. Yeah. Just like seeing where people are at. You can put someone's whole life together. You can. By their movements. Like I know because my job is social media. Yeah. So if someone looked at all the stuff I post, they could kind of piece together my routine and what I eat and this and that. Well, we can create a nice um, dossier on you for sure. <laughs> well, yeah. I know you got all the criminal <laughs> records. Oh, no, yeah. I got everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, I could put together a, a nice report on anybody. Again, just from lifestyle, just from everything. I mean, I could follow them around to a grocery store and just tell, oh, their favorite food is this. They pick out this, you know, just the smallest things. And again, the garbage, forget about it. You know how many receipts I find in there? People that just throw away their receipts because everything's electronic on bank statements now. Nobody keeps their receipts anymore. Yeah. So I can, I'll pull it out and it'll be a bag full of garbage of paperwork and bills they paid that they just tossed. And everything's in there. Now, what's the legality from you, from someone, anyone touching someone's garbage? Is that is that safe? As long as it's on the street, out for delivery. It's public public information. What if it's kind of near the garage? You no, can't... I can't trespass. Okay. Yeah, I can't trespass. It has to be out on the street. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Do you ever have any, like, uh, dog encounters or anything when you're on a stakeout? Dog? No, my dog is sometimes with me. Oh, you're, <laughs> yeah. he's part of the crew. Yeah, I take my little Dalmatian with me. <laughs> oh, uh, you have a Dalmatian? Yeah, the Dottie. Aww. Yeah, Dottie. Gets white hair everywhere, unfortunately. But, uh, yeah, she's a cutie. She's small, too, so... Um, she comes with me sometimes on surveillances. The only problem is every once in a while she'll start barking and give away my position. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, oh, shut up, you know. Uh, but no, I, the dogs um, on properties, like if I'm watching a property, not so much. I mean, sometimes when I'm knocking on doors, I'll have to deal with that. I'm always looking for beware of the dog signs, you know, because I'm not going to enter somebody's fence to go knock on their door if they have that. Um, and if I do, I'm cautious. You know what I mean? I'm always ready with, you know, whatever I'm carrying um, just in case because you can't trust animals. Who knows? Uh, but no, not too bad. Not surveillance, things like that. I'm usually far enough away from somebody's house. Even if the house I'm sitting in front of has a dog barking, it doesn't affect me. Are you connected with other um, private investigators in Connecticut? Is there like a group? Yeah, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, Florida, everywhere. Yeah. Do you guys have like meetings or um, no, conferences? Not, or not meetings. Like we more that? just feed off one each other. Like if I got a case, like that case I had with the, uh, the brothel. <clears throat> I found her in Florida. I called my guy in Florida, gave it to him, you know, instead of me flying down there. Um because I, we do fly out. I mean, I've flown out a lot of times on cases as well. But um, it's good to have investigators in other areas that you can rely on because you never know when you're going to need that. Mm -hmm. Are there ever any cases you turn down where you're like, no, I'm not touching that? Yeah, there are a few. Um, I do a lot of bug sweeping, okay, um, which is basically finding electronics in people's homes or cars. And that happens a lot in marital situations where they've separated and the husband wants to know if the wife is dating or – if they either one of them put something in there because they want to hear them talking to their attorney or whatever the case is. So they'll put some listening or camera device in the house. Um, so I do a lot of sweeps. I'll go through with all the electronics that I have and we'll sweep everything, see if there's any signals coming out. And we'll um, make them change all their passwords on everything they have, routers, everything. Um, and in that case, I'm sorry, what was the question on that? On um, cases you turned down. Oh, okay. So I get a lot of those. And when I before I take those, I, I really, really stringently interview the people because a lot of people will, and I don't want to be rude about it, but they're a little off, right? So they, they, they're kind of like aluminum foil wearing type people um, where you know right away that like, you know, oh, I think somebody implanted a bug in my eye. Come on, nobody did that. You know what I mean? So those people will call me and they'll, they'll be willing to spend the money, but I just, I feel like I'm taking advantage of them and it's not right, right? So in order for me to bug sweep your house, you got to give me a legitimate reason why and who do you think is doing it? And what do they have to gain? I always ask everyone, what's the end game? Are they looking for money? Are they looking for information? Or just to get their rocks off? Because I got to have a reason. They're not, you know, if you tell me that the, the, the federal government is after me because I, uh, you know, I clipped my tail, toenail too short, that's not going to work for me. I'm going to turn you down. What if you find a bug that the, a federal agency or law enforcement um, planted? Well, I tell my clients uh, for bug sweeping every time, there's two options, okay? If I find something in your home, I can either remove it, but then you can't do anything with it. You can you can say whatever you want. You can give it to your ex-husband or whoever, and you can say, but you can't involve police anymore because we destroy the chain of custody. So if I find something in someone's house, I will photograph it, videotape it, create a report, and tell them to go to a police department with the report. Because then the police department will investigate because a lot of times they think a lot of people are crazy too and they won't touch it. But if you give them a report from a PI that says, I found it, here's the photograph, here's where it is, nobody's touched it, they can go out, remove it, and it doesn't disturb the chain of custody so they can actually investigate it, run serial numbers or whatever's identifying on that, that unit that was found. Um, that happens. What are some unique and creative bugs that technology has created nowadays? Everything is Wi-Fi. 
you know, the problem with the problem with electronics right now, it's not like the movies where you put the little thing under somebody's lapel, <laughs> right? I mean, that's that not working. Every every electronic has, you know, let's like say a camera. You have to have the lens, you have to have power, and you have to have a transmitter, right, in order for it to put a signal out. That makes something from this small get big. I mean, it's not tiny anymore. Uh, there's too much going on to, to fit it all in. So I tell people, I said, you know, in order for a camera to be in here and see you, the lens has to be exposed. Can't be behind a wall. It's not behind sheetrock, right? Unless it's behind sheetrock and the lens is exposed, but I'll be able to find that with my equipment. You know, a lot of people think, oh, it's inside the insulation inside. First of all, they're not going to be able to see you. Even if it's a listening device, all they're going to hear is a muffled sound, right? They're not going to hear anything. So everything has to be exposed. If it's exposed, I can find it. They do have a lot of small ones where the unit itself that has the power, that has the battery, that has the um, electronics, a uh, motherboard, if you will, um, is you know a decent size. But then the 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 mic the um, the, le the lens itself for the camera or for the, the microphone itself could be a very small tube. That's a lot easier to hide. If you have drop ceiling somewhere, you can put that up there and just pop a pinhole in it and slide it through, and you're never going to see it. The only way to detect it is to find the signal, right? Um, but I mean, most, a lot of times I find more than I find listening devices or cameras cause they come in, well, I'm sure everybody knows at this point, clocks, radios, all kinds of things that they hi hit cameras inside. Um, those are pretty simple to find cause they're plug and play. You know, if you were living with someone and they, they, all of a sudden a new clock shows up in your bedroom, you're going to know, Hey, why is this clock here? You know what I mean? You're going to figure it out. Um, the more intricate stuff is more rare because you have to have people with expertise to put that in. You know, so if you're if you're married to a police officer, <laughs> maybe or an FBI agent, um, you know they might be able to put some some pretty uh, interesting stuff in your home. But ninety nine out of a hundred times, it's something that you can buy from Google. That's very easy to find. Um, or you're just like I had one guy one time who was tracking someone, and I had to do a sweep on their car because she's like, he knows where I am everywhere. He's got a GPS tracker. He didn't. He bought an iPhone. He put put the location services on. He slid it in the back of the, the seat. He just yeah. used the phone. And now there's air tags. Yeah, but air the tags. The cool thing about air tags is it'll tell you when one's in range now, on you. Now, but yeah. it didn't before. It didn't before. Okay. I had a lot of clients, and because I, I rent tracking devices for my clients, right, to legally put on cars. It's, it's Connecticut has certain parameters you have to follow in order to do it. <clears throat> but when the invention of those first was the the it wasn't the uh, air tag. It was another one, the key tag, key something. I forget what it was. It was an old one. Um, I don't know. It was a small one. Um, people were using that instead of paying me. They would just buy one of those things. And they were working okay. They're not real time. You have to ping them to find locations. So you don't get a, an idea of where the person has been all day, right? Um, you ping it now. He's at the grocery store. You ping it an hour later. He's home. You missed what happened in between if you actually saw somebody or went somewhere. Um, the AirTag came out, and that became oof, the biggest thing ever. And it didn't have um, any tracking thing like it does now, warnings. Um, and they got in trouble for that Apple. So they had to change the way that the software worked on it. So now it will automatically notify you that there's an AirTag near you if you have an iPhone. And, and if you have an Android, you can download an app that does the same thing. It'll tell you. But if you start to drive around, it's going to notify you over and over. It's following you, AirTag following you, AirTag following It's going to show you the route of yourself where that AirTag has followed you so you know. I've had three different people that called me up that, that could have been potential clients if they were smarter. <laughs> but instead, they did that first. And then they call me and say, hey, my I, my wife, I, I put one of these in my wife's car and she, I, I'm looking at it right now. She's at the police department. What do I do? I said, go to jail. <laughs> There's nothing I can do for you, right? Mm -hmm. You broke the law. You can't put that in there. You cannot do that. So they got arrested. They all got arrested. And now everything will track you. Your car, your phone, your watch. Yeah. Like literally anything. Yeah. It, if, it doesn't pay to be a criminal nowadays. It's it's hard. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to get away with anything, especially because if, you know, if it's, if it's a legal matter, police have access to everything. You know, they can get a warrant to, to, to get into it. Well, I don't know about cell phones because I don't think the FBI still broke into the cell phones. They still can't get the... Uh... Yeah, how true is that with the passwords? Because I was reading that they can't... I was an idiot, and when they uh, arrested me, they yeah. were like, what's your password? And I <laughs> tossed that up to them. Yeah. So stupid. But yeah. then I was reading articles that, like, Apple was going through the lawsuit with them, with the with the federal government about disclosing that. Yeah. I, I wonder how accurate that is. I don't know what the outcome was. Um, they've kept it hush. I haven't seen any stories on it. But I'm assuming that they probably figure out a way to circumvent it at this point. And if they haven't, they're fools. Um, because, I mean, that's basically everybody's life is on their phone. I mm -hmm. mean, you want anything on someone, it's there. It's not on your home computer anymore. Nobody barely uses that. Pay bills maybe, not even. Um, 
but your cell phone is with you everywhere. It's geo tracking. It's it's locations. It's texts. And it puts dates on the everything. phone. It literally yeah. pieces together everything. Yeah, the for metadata it. is amazing. <laughs> they they just pull everything on that. It's amazing. You, if I ever got in trouble, the first thing I'll do is throw it in the river. Yeah. You, oh, you can't bring your phone with you too. Yeah. Exactly. What do you think are the biggest changes needed in the criminal justice system from your point of view and what you've seen? Uh, I know, like you had spoken with someone else, the bail system is definitely tough um, because, you know, you have people that um, influential people get in trouble. They can put up the bailer bond. You have people that aren't. They can't. So that's kind of an unfair thing. But I don't also don't like what they're doing in New York City where cash bond just get out. Nothing, you know, because that just uh, that just tells criminals to just do whatever you want. You're just going to get out in three hours anyway. So that's something they really got to sit down and they got to they got to put some laws together to try to even it out. Um, you got to make it fair or, or they got to make it a little bit easier with the bail bond company for people to get what they need. Um, you know, 10%. Okay. If you, if you make a hundred grand a year, you got to pay 10%, 10, hundred grand a year or more, you make pay 10%. If you're indigent, maybe you only got to pay 5% or 2% or something like that. You know, you got to, you got to figure something out. I'm sure the bail bond companies wouldn't be happy with that though. But, um, but that's the biggest problem. I mean, once you get in the system, um, a lot of people, like even some sometimes people call me and they'll say, I have an attorney, I have a criminal charge, um, I want to get an investigator. I'll say, okay, well, I mean, go through your attorney, he can call me, you know, I can work through them. Well, no, I gave them a retainer, but they need that, I need to hire you on my own. I said, well, okay, this is going to be the, the retainer for me to do the work. I can't afford it. So if you can't afford me, you're not going to get me, right? So a lot of... A lot of people who are accused have attorneys, either either public defenders or private, if they can scrape up the money for that, but they don't have an investigator. And my my analogy with all my criminal clients is that attorneys are great, right? They, they've learned the system. They went to school. They, they know how to be in the system to fight for a client either way. But an attorney, in my analogy, is the gun in court. I'm the ammunition, right? So if I don't get them ammunition for that gun, they're just firing blanks. What are they going to argue if they don't have any evidence to back them up, if they don't have any contradictory things to, to present to the court or to the jury? That's what we do. Like I'll go out and I'll, I'll take a police report and I'll scrutinize the hell out of it to find any inconsistencies. And then even if they talk to witnesses, everybody who takes a statement or an interview someone does it with a slant on their vision, right? So if I represent the defense, I'm interviewing someone with questions that I want them to answer that help my defensive side. Same with the prosecution. They're doing the same thing on the other side. So when you read an a, a interview from a police officer and it says this, 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 and this, that doesn't necessarily mean that's what all that the person has said to them. So I'll go out and re-interview all of them and I'll find out, well, you said this too? Well, wait a minute. This is what the police officer said. I didn't say that. You know, so there's a lot of inconsistency. So you need someone like me to go out and knock on doors and find new witnesses and find contradictory things so that when the attorney does go to court, they have something to present. Yeah. I mean, you know, in the fed federal system, their public defenders aspect and the CGA aspect of it, they pay for that. Like in my case, my my private investigator was paid for under that. Mm -hmm. And also the feds kind of have a fair bail system where you're not putting up money. It's a, do you check the boxes? Are you a danger? Um, and are you a flight risk? And maybe that should be implemented in the state system. It's true. A lot of, um, I've never, I've never, I've signed up a couple times in the court system to be an investigator, but then when it comes to negotiating rates, they're always so low. Yeah, it is very low. So, you know, it's like, all right, well, I would like to help, but, you know, I'm not going to, you know, put aside my bills to help somebody else. This is what I charge. I can't get it. I can only get a third of what I make. I can't do it. You know, so you, if you are getting investigators, you know, I don't know what kind of investigators, good, maybe not, I don't know, but you're getting someone who needs that work as opposed to someone who wants to do the work. You know, for someone to take such a low rate, that means that they probably don't have much on their caseload. That means that they're just taking whatever they can get and they'll take whatever pay they can get. That doesn't mean they're bad. It just means that they're obviously not in demand. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so they may get an investigator, but that investigator may not have the budget through the state. The state say, oh, I'll give you a $1,200 budget at $35, $40 an hour, whatever it is they want to pay. Okay, that's great. But I really, in order for me to knock on, track down every witness, knock on every door, make sure I get them home instead of just driving back and forth in his empty house, it's going to cost five grand. You know, I got to go back and forth and back and forth. And then I got to talk to them, interview them. If they have something good to say, sit down, put an affidavit together for two hours, convince them to sign it. You know what I mean? I'm out there for a long time. I'm not going to be able to fit that into your little budget. So what's going to happen? You're just not going to get the quality investigation that you need. Unfortunately. How, how do you balance uh, work and, and home? Because I feel like your job is like you're always active. 
uh, because I have an awesome wife. <laughs> <laughs> when I met her, and I met her 400 years ago, uh, we've been oh, together. Oh, you're that old? Yeah, wow. Exactly. <laughs> no, nah, we've been together for quite a while, though. Um, when I met her, uh, she was actually working at DCF at the time. She was a DCF worker. Tough job. And I was a private detective, and she didn't believe me at first because she didn't really know. It was back then when we were still private, right? And now everybody knows who we are. Um, she bet me that way. So my, my schedule was always, you know, 3 in the morning, I got to run. 6 in the morning, I'm gone. 5 in the morning, I'm gone. Uh, and then when I'm home, I'm there. I'm present. You know what I mean? But then when I got to go, I got to go. And it just, it's, she knows that from me from the day I met her. So when I tell her, oh, I just got a call. I got to go. She's like, okay. You know, it's not a big deal. There's no arguments. There's never a fight about it. Um, and she's in real estate. So it's kind of the same thing with her. She'll be running around all kinds of places. Um, but it's, if I had met, if I had become a private detective after five years being married, that might be a problem because now all of a sudden I go from a nine to five, I'm home every night for dinner to, well, oh, sorry, I can't be next three weeks. I'm gone every night from, you know, six at night until three in the morning. No, nobody's going to put up with that. But if you, if you, it's like a, a turtle in hot water, you know, slowly you put them in cold water and you turn it up, turtle doesn't realize it because slowly it boils. Same thing. I met her when I did that and I already had this weird schedule. So she's already been, she's used to it. Yeah. You kind of know what you sign up for yeah, exactly. when you get involved. Yeah. And then when I'm, when I am home, I have a daughter. Um, I, I spend a lot of time with my daughter, you know, I help her study for school. We do this, we do that. I mean, I spend a lot of quality time with her. So everybody's happy. What, what's one thing you want people to know about your line of work and maybe a misconception you want to clear up? Um, misconception. I don't know, but I get a lot of people that say, Oh, they give them a card and they say, oh, thank God, I'll never need you. <laughs> Keep the card because we, it's not just about criminal activity or cheating. Um, you may need to find somebody. You may need information. You may need something. We, we, it's hard to explain exactly what we do. I mean, I get requests that even I didn't think would ever come to me. And then we just figure out how to get it done, right? Because mm -hmm. everything is about information, whether it's surveillance, I get information on tape, video, or it's, uh, you know, digging through garbage. I get information that way, or it's computers, that's what we do. We find information. So you never know when you're going to need us. So to automatically just say, ah, oh, I never need you. Not true. Yeah. I guarantee you in two years, half my Facebook friends have called me for stuff. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. You know, you, they, never you thought never they, know. Have, they never thought they would need me. But next thing you know, I get some odd requests for something. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you never know when uh, you're, you're sitting on the other end of the chair and, and something could happen. It's, yeah. uh, you know, life's crazy in that respect. Yeah, you're right. But uh, Ray, thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really fun you. conversation. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, Appreciate it. Yeah, pleasure talking to you. And uh, I'm glad I got a uh, private investigator <laughs> now. You got but a few. I, I got a few, yeah. <laughs> well, he does more federal work. Yeah, um, yeah Mark I, I, who came I heard on. him talk about arson and everything. Yeah. Um, but if I ever, you know, have a cheating spouse or something, you know, when I get married one day. Well, not just that. Remember, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you, man. We'll put the links to your uh, TikTok, whatever else you want, website in the, in the bio of this episode. Um, and we'll get you the clips. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on.